worship you, God. We praise you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, we lift our voices and sing to the King. We sing to the King, Lord, most high God. Jesus, we praise you. We thank you for who you are. We worship you for who you are, God. We declare that you are God, and we love you so much. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning, Lord. Thank you for your grace, God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, hallelujah. We worship you with everything in us tonight. We praise you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you, Lord.
stop for one second. We're singing these words, but I want you just to take these words like you really mean it, like Jesus is here, not just singing it by rote. And I want you to picture him right here, and you're telling him you're never going to let me down. You're never going to let me down. Do you believe that tonight? Do you believe that tonight? Let's not just sing words. Let's tell him. Let's tell him. We're just going to sing that line over and over for a little bit. You're never going to let. You're never going to let me down. Just make that your declaration tonight. You're never going to let. You're never going to let me down. Thank you for who you are, God. 
I praise you. I praise you, Lord. Nina, tonight as you first sat down, when I looked at you, I just felt like the Lord's heart for you, and I just know I have to tell you, and it's nothing big, but what he wants to tell you is that this is what I heard. Let me just say how he said it. He said, that's my daughter, and I'm so proud of her. And he sees you, and he sees what you've been going through. And he sees that you have felt sometimes like maybe you failed or just like you're not, you're not meeting the mark. But he wants you to know tonight that he loves you, that you're his beloved, that you belong to him. That he's so proud of you. That your father loves you tonight. He wants you to know that. sing a love song to him tonight. Just sing from your heart.
Lord, be honored, be glorified. Be honored, Lord, be glorified. Jesus. blessing and honor and glory to you, Jesus. Praise your name. Praise your name. Bless you, Lord. Praise you. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you. I worship you. I love you. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing in here tonight. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for moving in our midst and, and touching us. Those here and those watching, because those watching are not exempt from this. You're moving there too. Bless you, Jesus. Praise your name. Glory and honor to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Father, the atmosphere <clears throat> that's in here right now, it doesn't have to end just because we stop singing. Father, this atmosphere will continue. Your presence is wonderful. In your presence is everything. I thank you, Father, that even right now, healing is manifesting in some people's bodies. Here and where people are watching. Thank you. Thank you. Praise you, Father. Bless your name, Jesus. You're wonderful. You're glorious. Father, may we get past every bit of formula when it comes to our relationship with You. And may it become true relationship. Father, I believe that most, if not all of us here and watching have been impacted in our lives by religion that has presented to us form and formula when it comes to walking with you. And yet when we see Jesus as our pattern, there is no formula with Him. We do not see that in the four Gospels. What we see is somebody who had a relationship with you. 
He lived out of that relationship and he ministered out of that relationship. That's the way it can be for us as well. So Father, may every shred of religion be torn down in us. And may we live every day out of a pure, glorious relationship with You. Incredible fellowship. Thank You, Father. And I thank You for how You're going to minister to us this night. And Jesus, all the glory goes to You. Thank You, Savior. In Your name, Lord Jesus, Amen. Amen. Praise God. God's presence does not have to diminish. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Why don't you... Praise God. As we continue in... Uh, I don't know how to say it other than when we continue in this, this um, our pressing into God, you know, our services are going to continue to transition into, ah, what's the right word? More unpredictability. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. You know, Jesus upset the apple cart of religion when He was here on earth. And I say, just keep doing it, Lord. <laughs> you can uh, turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll start there. As many of you know, the body of Christ is, uh, is being called to a greater level of accountability in the Lord. Not just in this church, but all over. How we respond to that is going to make a huge difference. And in some cases, you have a lot of Christians, they're not going to turn their back on God, but to use a term that maybe we're familiar with, they're going to be left in the dust when it comes to those who are really pressing forward with, forward with God. One of the worst, I guess worst is a good way to put it, but one of the worst things that we could do is come to the place of believing that we have reached the pinnacle of what it means to press into God because we haven't. Through prayer, fasting, worship, and the Word. That's how we continue to press into God. So therefore, no matter how much of those four we are doing, we need to constantly be evaluating our life and how we redeem the time to find out how much more of those four we can do. There is a... Um, Well, let me just share with you, I'm going to be sharing with you at least a couple of visions here tonight. One of them is, um, we don't realize how much, um, I'll, I'll use the term flesh, that we have. And as we are pressing forward into God. And in this vision, it was of a person, you know, running. And as they were running, more and more layers of flesh were just peeling off, kind of like a, a snake when it sheds its skin. It's kind of like that. And the person's running and running and running. And as this person is running, you know, obviously the image, they're, you know, running into God. But more and more of that flesh is coming off. You know, one layer after another. It's just coming off. And they're going deeper into God. Because ultimately what we're looking for is the fullness of who we are in Christ 
becoming that which we're clothed with, if that makes any sense. The flesh, the us, removed. You know, kind of like what um, John the Baptist said, he must, I must decrease and he must increase. That kind of a thing. The Apostle Paul made the statement that he did not see himself as having fully arrived. Well, you know, if anybody in the Bible other than Jesus had fully arrived, you'd think maybe the Apostle Paul. But even he realized, I haven't fully arrived. I'm not there yet. I'm still pressing toward that goal, toward that mark. It's the same thing for us. We cannot allow ourselves to believe that we have reached a place to where, well, we, we just cannot do any more than we're doing to go deeper into Him. You know, I shared here not too long ago, it's very possible that some of us get to the place to where, you know, at least on a temporary basis, there is no television at all. None. And for us to try that now would be almost impossible because we have not shed enough flesh to get to that point. And the flesh slash emotions would beat us to a pulp. But I do believe that as we continue to press into God, it's very possible we'll get to the point to where not watching TV will not be a challenge. Obviously, it will be different for each person. But, if we want to be used by God, we have to have the attitude that I'm going to continue to press into Him regardless of the results. Because the results will be good. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 19, it says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So in verse 19, it is an exhortation, an edification, an encouragement that if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are now a member of his family. Where it says, and of the household of God, I mean, that literally means you, from his perspective, you've moved in to the house. You're part of the family. And then the verse 20, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. That's describing the maturation process. That now, we're, now that we're born again, what we see recorded in Scripture is that which enables us to grow, to mature, to be built up, if you will, using this term here in verse 20. And when it talks about Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, that talks about Jesus as the foundation for the Word. Jesus, the Word make flesh. You know, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Jesus is the cornerstone of Scripture. It all rests on Him. So therefore, this is the only way that we grow. In other words, what is revealed in Scripture, that is what we have to apply if we want to grow and mature. And we've come to the place of understanding that what is revealed in Scripture when it comes to spiritual growth is prayer, fasting, worship, and the Word. Those four impact us directly on a spiritual level. Out of that comes everything else. When I was, I don't know, maybe... 12, 11, 12, at somewhere around there, maybe 13, nah, I don't think it was 13. Nevertheless, when I was younger, <laughs> mom got this, um, this amazing idea that my sister and I needed to take piano lessons. Now, I'm here to tell you, I just don't believe that was a thus saith the Lord. And I can remember, <laughs> we didn't have a piano. 
So uh, they purchased a piano from a family in our church, the Birchfields. And I remember the day that it was brought to the house. They paid $60 for this piano. It was an old upright piano. And I remember when the movers brought it, they set it up there in the living room, up against the wall. And I don't know, that looked more like a casket to me <laughs> than a piano. <laughs> it's like, we got to do this. So we started taking lessons. And I couldn't stand it. I mean, I absolutely could not stand it. And, you know, the teacher, um, I don't know, she kind of put up with us. My sister and I both, you know, and, and it was the practice stuff, you know. Well, you got to practice at least 30 minutes a day. You, uh, oh, no, that, that's 30 minutes of play time, okay. No, I don't want to practice. But anyway, practiced. And I did not practice 30 minutes a day. I might have practiced 30 minutes a week, whatever. And mom was always, have you practiced? Get in there and practice. Get in there and practice. I just, I just couldn't stand it. And I mean, literally, the muscles back here, would, they would not up and start burning. It was horrible. And this went on for about, I don't know, three years. And I, you know, I, I progressed. How many of you know what the John Schwamm books are? You don't? Okay. Those are books that are used to teach kids how to plant. You have book number one, book number two, book number three. It's like a dun 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 I just never applied myself. Well, anyway, I don't know how this came about, but mom changed piano teachers for us. So we go to this new piano teacher, Mrs. Elam. She lived on Wyoming Street. And she had this grand piano in her living room. So my sister and I, we go in there, and you know she's working with us. I think after about like four, maybe five lessons, when mom came by to pick us up, she called mom aside and had a little meeting. And then after the after the you know we got home, you know mom told us what the meeting was about. Mrs. Elam told my mom that for the last three years she's wasted her money. <laughs> Seriously, that's what she told her. And she said the reason is because the previous teacher did not do a very good job. She said they both should be much further along than what they are by this time. She said you wasted your money. And at this point, they're not putting forth any effort. I don't think this is going to work. And so mom said, okay. So we didn't have to take piano lessons anymore. Glory, glory. And mom and dad got rid of the piano. I don't know. They, maybe they took it out and burned it or something. I don't know. But they got rid of the piano. And that was the end of that. Now the reason I'm telling you this story is because the Lord reminded me of it. And He reminded me of it to use it as an illustration for people who hopefully you're watching or you're listening, but you're watching after the fact, something like that. Anyway, here's what he said. How many more years will you remain in a church or keep listening to preachers not emphasizing the doctrine of Jesus and the apostles? How many more years? And every time you put money in the offering plate, it's just like my mom was paying the, the teacher for our lessons that really weren't doing us as much good as they thought. How many more years are you going to stay in a place like that? Because we are being called to a higher level of accountability. Now, I'm going to use some terms that we understand. Okay? They are human terms. They do not necessarily 100% the exact, represent the exact reflection or uh, the words that God would use. But so that we understand that, it's as though God is saying, 
I've had it. I've had it with you kids. And it's time to grow up. You get your stinking act together. Do you hear me? And one of the reasons that the sternness of God is being delivered in the body of Christ today is because he knows the clock is ticking. And it is just a matter of time before the book of Revelation begins manifesting in full force and Jesus is going to come back and there's a bunch of Christians that aren't going to make it. And it's like he's putting his foot down, as they say. And I mean, you know, stomp. Are you listening to me? Are you kids listening to me? You know, it's kind of like parents say, get in there and clean your room. I've had it with this dirty room. God is saying, I've had it with this lackadaisical attitude toward your, your relationship with me, toward who you are in Christ. Now, so many Christians can come back and say, well, I'm not a, you know, I don't do drugs. I'm not a, you know, I'm not in sin. Maybe not. And thank God for that. But do you realize in Scripture, it talks about the believers, Christians, we're supposed to be doing more for God than what we see. Didn't Jesus say, these signs shall follow them that believe? Now, how many signs are following me? How many signs are following you? So something's wrong. And we have become, in the body of Christ, so accustomed to nothing happening, we just assume that's the norm. And Jesus said, if you believe in me, the works that I do, you shall do also. So how many of, of the Jesus works am I doing? How many of the Jesus works are you doing? The truth is, Almost none. For whatever reason. Almost none. One person's not fasting enough. Another person's not praying enough. Another person... I mean, it doesn't matter. We can go through all kinds of whatever whys. It's, just, it's not going on. And it's supposed to. And it's not God's fault. It's ours. When I was a kid, I had the ability to pick up my toys and put them away. But I didn't unless I got yelled at. When I was a kid taking those piano lessons, I had the ability to put forth more effort and do a better job. And I look back on it now, and I wish I had. I truly wish I had. Little sidestep, you have no idea how many times on the inside of me I hear songs. And if I could only play the piano, I could develop those songs. I'm talking worship songs. Years, it's been like that. Now, I knew a preacher, and I will not give you his name. I met him, you know, he's a nice guy, was in a service where he was preaching. This guy was incredibly impressive. I remember one particular service, he had everybody turn to, and I don't remember the, the chapter, but turn to such and such, like that. So let's just, I'm just going to pick a verse, I'm going to pick a chapter. Though what I pick may be wrong, because I don't remember what chapter. Just say, turn to Matthew 14, you know. And everybody turns to Matthew 14. And he's standing up there, and he starts quoting Matthew 14, King James, word for word, from verse 1. And he just keeps, he's just going through it. And at one point, he said, trust me. I mean, he said, look at your Bible. He said, I know I'm right. And he's quoting from it. Just, and it's like, oh, wow, this is really... <laughs> I wish I could do that. Well, he was very impressive. His delivery, he was one of these kind of preachers to where he captured your attention. But he had some doctrine that wasn't right. And I knew it. And I can remember some of the people uh, the next day, you know, groove, you know, everybody's talking, I'm kind of listening. Oh, last night, wasn't that the best sermon? Oh my goodness, that was so good. Oh, and, you know, choose your battles, right? Well, I didn't say anything. 
But what I could have said was, do you have any idea how wrong that was scripturally? Do you have any idea how badly he missed it? How much he misinterpreted that passage when he was teaching it? And yet, there was another pastor who had this guy come to his church prior to when I was in a service. And I'm talking to this other pastor who had had this guy in, the, in his church, I don't know, two, three times, whatever. I was going to have him back. And as we were talking, the subject of the scriptural accuracy came up. And the other pastor said, yeah, I know, but the people really like him. It's like, okay. There's nothing more that I should say. Not nothing more I could say. <laughs> Leave it alone. Because the moment you say, I know, and then follow it with a but, well, you're, you're accountable. And it wasn't that everything that came out of this preacher's mouth was wrong, but a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now, we cannot continue allowing ministers to speak into our lives who are off. We've had people in the, you know, over 20 years that I've been here, we've had people who did that. And some of them, they're gone. They're no longer here because, in part, they opened themselves to other stuff. And my, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, then show me how those preachers are contextually accurate and I'm not. That's not a braggart statement. It just show me. Help me understand. Because when I find out some of the preachers that some other people listen to, and I know the kind of things they teach, I think, you know what? You've had a foundation laid for you and, and you jumped off it. And, and you're embracing something else that's not going to do you any good. It's just going to lead you astray. Hopefully it won't lead you completely away but it's leading you astray. And I've, I've noticed um, a really interesting, and I'll use the word phenomenon for, um, <laughs> for emphasis. Those of you who receive my emails, as you know, I have been sending out not only my monthly letter, but I've been sending out emails that have prophecies on them. Now it's not my fault if you don't check your email. And it's not my fault if you don't check your spam folder to see if stuff is in there that shouldn't be in there. But I'm sending them out. So if you've ever gotten an email from me, you're on that email list. So you, sh you are, they are being sent to you. What you do with it is that, you know, that's, that's you. But I started writing my monthly teaching letters back in, I think it was the fall of 1997. So now here we are, what, 23 years later. 23 years, that's a, that's a lot. <laughs> 23 years later. Now, I have only sent the prophecies out 17 times. Now, I sent the prophecies, and then it was maybe two or three weeks or a month later Then I sent. And then I, I be, I've been sending them like once a week. Send them out ever since then. Only 17 times have I sent those prophecies. That means only 17 weeks have I sent the prophecies out. So, we have 23 years for the letters and 17 weeks for the prophecies. And here's what's interesting. In those 17 weeks that I've sent out the prophecies, I have received more take me off your mailing lists than in all the 23 years of the letters combined. Every week, except one, every week, I have received take me off, take me off, take me off, take me off. Every week. 
except for one. And the one I received, it, it wasn't a specific, you know, take me off, it was something else. So 16 weeks, I keep getting, take me off, take me off, because of the prophecies. Not the letters. The prophecies. I find that very interesting because the prophecies are prophetic utterances that have come from God by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And you understand that process. The letters are not prophecies. Now, in some, sometimes I put prophecies in the letters. But the letters are letters. Now, I pray about the letters. You know, God help me, whatever, you know, so forth. But the prophecies are totally different. Totally different. The prophecies, and I know a lot of Christians might struggle with this concept, but the prophecies are equal to Scripture based on their source. They're not new Scripture. They're not additional Scripture. But they come from the exact same source. Now you should understand that. A prophecy is a word from God. So that means when, when folks are saying, take me off your list, take me off your list, take me off, regardless of why they say take me off the list, what they're doing is they're saying, I do not want to receive a word from God. That's what they're saying. Now, if you're watching this and you said, and you're one of the take me off the list people, well, I, I said take me off the list because I just get too many emails. You know what? Please don't argue with me about this. I mean, seriously, I'm not offended by it. It's just something that I have noticed. It's, and it really has captured my attention. It's like, okay, why is that? You know, if people don't like me that much. Tell me you don't want the letters anymore. Oh, and by the way, when they send a take me off your list, there's only one list. So you don't get the prophecies anymore and you don't get the letters either. That's just the way it works. The prophecies are a word from God. Now, if you don't want them, you don't want them. That, that's between you and God. But most people I know get a bunch of emails they could do without. I'm not talking trashy stuff. I'm just a bunch of emails I could do without. But you're saying, take me off a list. I don't want to receive any more words from God. Now, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. What I'm doing is bringing to light what's going on in the body of Christ. Maybe you don't think these prophecies are genuine from God, but I've also gotten some response from some people, thank you for sending these. I, in fact, I got a, I've had some responses uh, where people, it's almost like they're saying, well, one person in particular said, I was going through such and such, and I got that email with those prophecies, and the one prophecy was exactly what I needed to hear. It spoke to me and my situation. Well, I don't know that going in. I just send them out. And I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. I'm just sharing with you what's going on. Now, uh, in a, you're in Ephesians chapter 2. Look back in same chapter, in chapter 1. It says, I'm, no, no, I said chapter 1, I'm sorry. Chapter 2, go back to the beginning of chapter 2, verse 1. Verse 1. And you where it says, hath he quickened, we're going to skip that. And you who were dead in trespasses and sins. Not dead because of, dead in them. Meaning, whether you committed a trespass or sin or not, you were still dead. <laughs> the trespasses in the sins didn't create the spiritually dead condition in your life. You were spiritually dead anyhow. You who were dead in trespasses in sin. And then he begins describing in verse 2, here's what it means, here's what happens, here's what it's like when you're dead in trespasses and sin. In time past, what does time past? Time prior to salvation. In time past, you lived according to the course of this world. You lived according to the standards, the platforms, the beliefs. 
the, the, the way things go in the world. You lived according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who's that? That's Satan. Why did you do that? Because you and he shared the exact same spiritual nature. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Who are the children of disobedience? The lost. Among whom also we all, all of us, me, Paul, you know, and, and Timothy, and why, Peter, and John, and James, and all of us, everybody, among whom also we all had our conversation or lifestyle in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind. That right there is so critical, of the mind. I'm not going to go off on this, but that tells you right there, you better be feeding the word into your mind, because no word, well, your mind is not going to have anything to work with. And we're by nature, the children of wrath, even as others, by nature, there it is, by nature, your spiritual nature. And where he says in the beginning of this verse, time, in times past, the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, don't be thinking simply of um, physically intimate behavior. It's whatever the flesh wants. This flesh wants this, well, then okay, I do what the flesh wants. The mind meditates on this way, that's what I'm going to do. He's simply saying, you didn't have a nature of God on the inside of you, so basically what you did was live according to the desires of the flesh and what seemed reasonable to your mind as it was coupled with the lost sin nature. That's just what you did. He said, but God. <laughs> but, now this is one time when the word but is really good. <laughs> but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Now, what he's described here in verses 2 and 3, that pretty much would seem like a disqualification from the love of God. A disqualification from the mercy of God. But he says, you know what? God is rich in mercy. And for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. Not dead because of sins, but dead in sin. He's repeating himself. The sin wasn't the problem. The nature was the problem. The nature birthed the sin. Even when we were dead in sins, He, God, the rich in mercy and great love God, hath quickened us together with Christ. That literally, I'm not going to go off and, and really break all this down, but that literally means the same way, the same love, the same power that He used to raise Jesus from the dead is what He used to raise us from the dead. From, from death, spiritual death. Same thing. There's no difference. No difference. None. Absolutely none. We are equal to Jesus Christ in spiritual resurrection. Totally equal to him. Well, just not, we're not deity. Never will be. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay, here's the imagery. We know in Scripture it talks about Jesus being raised from the dead and, and God and gave him the name that is above every name and now he's seated at the right hand of God on the, on the right of the throne of majesty. He's seated there. And then here God is saying, okay, because you put your faith in Jesus Christ, I did the same thing for you that I did for him. Do you understand that? This is what he's saying here. I did the same thing for you that I did for Jesus. It's just that, you know, he's the second person of the Godhead, and you're not. But when it comes to what's being described here, and you passing from spiritual death to spiritual life, you being raised from that death, God's saying, I did the same thing for you that I did for him. And not only that, but he says right here, sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That means... We are seated at the right hand of God. That's what that means. Oh, I thought Jesus was there. Yeah, well, we're there too. But, but how can we both be there? Okay, just imagine the biggest chair you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> and we're not all scrunchy crammed up in there, okay? No, he's trying to get across to us that other than deity, which will never be, 
We hold the same position as Jesus. That's who we are. Our problem is not understanding that. Our problem with so many Christians, they don't even believe that. I'm just a sinner. Saved by grace. Well, you better get that fixed because sinners can't sit at the right hand of God. That's not going to happen. And so he tells us, this is who you are. And if that is who I are, then I ought to be doing what I should be doing. Which is what the first person on that seat did. You know what I'm talking about. He set the example. So therefore, if I'm seated with him, then I should be doing these same things. I should come to the place of knowing who I am. I should be able to talk like Jesus and know that I'm speaking truth. He says, I and my Father are one. Who's your Father? Well, God. You and God are one? Yeah. Jesus. That sounds crazy. Well, I mean, that's just the way it is. And so now here we are born again, and based on what we see just in this passage, we have the, the, the position, the ability, the permission, the right to say, I am one with God. I am one with God. Now, you know how many Christians? No, that can't be true. Look at me. That can't be true. But it is. This is what God did for us. It's the restoration back to his original Genesis 1, Genesis 2 plan. So I am equal to Jesus in resurrection, but not equal in deity. I am one with God. And Jesus even talked about that in, in John chapter 17. Well, Here's the thing. <laughs> if you've got preachers out there, it doesn't matter if they're traveling preachers or pastors, and they're not teaching these things, you don't need to be in that church. You know, we're at a place now, years ago, I would tell people, okay, you, you really need to pray about this. You really need to pray about staying in a church like that. But now, now it's gotten to the point to where it's like God is sticking his finger out and he's saying, get out of those churches because they are not going to have you prepared for the end time revival and you will never be able to do the works of my son. Get out of those churches. I was raised in that church. You think that, you think that worries God? You think he's up there and thinking, oh, oh, yeah, I, I forgot about that. You, you were raised in that church. Okay, well, you know, just stay there then. That's okay. No. Wait a minute. If God doesn't approve of it, why in the world would you? If God doesn't approve of you listening to preacher XY and preacher Z and preacher AB, and all, if he doesn't approve of, of the doctrine they're delivering, why do you? Why? Well, I'd rather listen to that than the garbage that's on the radio. I would rather listen to like 1940s big band music. <laughs> Some of you look at me like, what? <laughs> I'd, I'd rather sit down and watch a, a John Wayne movie. I'm serious. You know, most of his movies are good guys win. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not just saying that. I mean, I'm serious. I, I don't want to waste my spirit on stuff that's supposed to be feeding me. If I watch John Wayne, I know my spirit's not going to be fed. I know I'm just watching a, you know, a Western. I, I don't have an expectation going in that I'm going to hear deep calleth unto deep. I just have an expectation that, you know, there's going to be a shoot 'em up. <laughs> but when I turn something Christian on, I have an expectation that I'm going to hear something that's going to feed me, and so therefore I automatically open myself up to receive. And if I can't tell the difference between the two, if I cannot discern what I'm hearing is right or wrong, then I am not with God where I should be. Look, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And just look, one verse, verse 38. If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. That's a, that's a classic. 
Because basically what he's saying, now remember all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and basically what he's saying is this. You know what? If you're, if you're just going to be stubborn and not submit to good teaching, if, if you are just going to be ignorant, then you know what? Be ignorant. Because there's, not, not, God, there's nothing even God can do. I think he's not going to make you listen to the right stuff. He's not going to grab you by the scruff of the neck and throw you out of the church he doesn't want you in. He's going like to let you make your own decisions. And we are getting, we, we are too far into what's happening in the world to be messing around with this stuff. I mean, you, you can't do it anymore. And the, uh, look in Psalm chapter 61. See, when, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. When you join the ignorance, what you're actually doing is lowering yourself to their level. And as you do, you are distancing yourself from where you are seated in Christ. And if it continues, and what he showed me in that is, if it continues, those who allow it to continue, they're actually climbing off that throne and going a different direction. You got preachers right now that are doing that. You got preachers right now who've done that. And they are so ignorant, they refuse to study to show themselves approved. And they refuse to listen to teaching that corrected. Look, there are a lot of pastors out there right now. Honestly, they should be removed. But they're not going to be. And God's not... God is not going to force somebody to change. Now, as far as what's going on here, look in Psalm 61, look at verse 1. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Now stop right there. I know for a fact there are some people either attending here or listening. At times you felt like your heart is overwhelmed. Now, when that happens, when you start feeling like that, if you do not go to the rock that is higher than you, don't complain. I mean, don't come in here boohooing. And I don't mean to sound harsh, but what I'm saying is this. Look, you've got, right, here's your answer. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For th- Look here. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. See that? So what we see then, shelter, strong tower, tabernacle, covert. See that? This is all a place of protection. All of it. And it is God protecting. One of the things that he showed me this, again, another little vision thing. Tonight, we're worshiping the Lord. When I came up here, what he showed me is, as we are worshiping, what we're literally doing is we are creating a protective barrier around us, around this place. Not just a figure of speech. We are creating a protective barrier. Listen to me. We, through our praise and worship, are creating a fortress. That's what's happening here when we worship the Lord. We don't really grasp that. But now, He's told us. So now we know. How much more should we worship? How much more should we take advantage of the times that we, even with the pre-service worship, I mean, it's the same thing. When we have that heart attitude of worship and praising God, we are creating this place of protection. And it's not that it goes away when we leave. It's like we continue to reinforce it and reinforce it and reinforce it. We, again, look here, we have shelter, strong tower, tabernacle, covert. Those four things, okay? This church is a shelter. This church 
is a strong tower. This church is a tabernacle, and this church is a covert. This church is all of those things. Now here's what's happened. And again, I am not trying to, I'm not hammering anybody. I'm just telling you this is what's going on. Ever since we started this Sunday night, 30 minutes of prayer, 30 minutes teaching, 30 minutes of prayer, attendance on Sunday night has gone down. Why? It's because people don't want to be here for the prayer time. That's what it is. It's like, okay, well, you know what? You're speaking volumes because you would at least get 30 minutes of teaching. That doesn't matter. And I'm not trying to give you a hard time. I'm, look, this is again, this is like, again, it's God. It's like, are you listening to this? Are you listening? There's a reason. I, I, I know we got people that have to drive distances and that's why they don't come back. I get it. That's cool. <laughs> but that's not what this is about. There are people just don't come back and the reason they don't come back is because they do not value the praise and worship. They do not value the 30 minutes of the teaching and they do not value the prayer time. And, and some folks are like, well, now, Brother Martin, that's just not true. That, no, wait a minute. Hold on here. It was different before we started the 30 minutes of teaching and 30 minutes of prayer. It was different. So don't tell me that it really matters when it doesn't. God is calling us to accountability. That's what's happening here. Now, I'm in on this too. I just happen to be the one up here, you know, don't beat, the, don't beat up the messenger. <laughs> if it were possible for me to sit there at the same time I'm standing here, that's what I would do. <laughs> the prayer center in Immokalee is a, a tabernacle, a shelter, a covert, a tower, a strong tower. The prayer center in Tulsa, same thing. And you've got people that have bailed out. Why? It's because their walk with God, they're at a point in their walk with God to where they have become satisfied. And as the accountability is increasing, they're not comfortable with it. So they leave. And they either stay home or they go somewhere else. Where the sermons aren't as heavy. <laughs> How are you going to explain all this to God when you stand before Him in judgment? Seriously. What do you say to Him? In, um, in 1990, late 19, in late 2019, it's like God ramped up the call to the church for greater commitment. Now, one of the ways that that was made known was through what we refer to as the blueprint prophecies. And a copy of those is back there on the table. Not everybody's taken them. Oh, that's on you. But they're here. There was a greater call, or a call to greater commitment. And it started in late 2019. Well, in response to that, now listen closely to this. In response to that, starting May 26, 2020, the protests and the riots began. Now, in Minneapolis alone, now some people could say, well, well, no, what happened, that one fellow was killed. And, okay, I'm not going to go off on that. All I'm going to tell you is this. I have spoken to people in law enforcement about that, and there's more to that story than has ever been released to the public. I have spoken to law enforcement who have seen the extended version of the video that was recorded. And they told me, here's what happened. But the public's never going to hear this. Now, in Minneapolis alone, where this riot started, as of June 8, 2020, now we're way past June 8, but as of June 8, 2020, the riot started on May 26. As of June 8, 2020, over 19 people were dead, over $500 million in destruction, 14,000 people arrested. That's just in a few days. Now guess what? There's no way that the legal system can handle an influx of 14,000 arrests at one time. They're going to be released. They cannot handle it. And I understand that. And a lot of people say, how come nobody's being arrested? <laughs> well, talk to the 14,000 in Minneapolis. That's just one city. 
How many other cities have we seen this stuff going on? It is a response to what was started in late 2019. What we're seeing, those, um, the, the riots, in, and this is what the Lord was sharing with me, and I'm going to get to a vision He showed me in just a moment. These riots that are taking place, they are a manifestation in the natural of the pushback in the spirit to what happened, what began in late 2019. Satan's fighting back. And this is what he's doing. That's what these riots are about. That is why they're happening. He has found people that he can manipulate into doing these things. Now it's going to, inten it's going to intensify. Now here's, this was interesting. This is the vision he gave me. Sometimes when God gives you a vision, you can have a vision that lasts two seconds and it's actually a lot longer than the two seconds. In other words, what you see in the spirit is like God, you know, he knows the beginning from the end. Well, he shows you something in the spirit and you, what you see didn't take nearly as long as what it represents. So now here's what I saw. <laughs> I saw these, this bunch of people. I mean, it's like this huge, I don't know how many people, just this huge group of people, you know, walking down the street, screaming, yelling, you know, rioting, throwing things in the buildings and just, I mean, destroying, just tearing up and just, I mean, going wild. And I'm thinking, well, okay, does this represent Portland? Does this represent Minneapolis? I mean, what exactly is this? And the Holy Spirit began explaining that to me. He said, no. That's what's happening in the realm of the Spirit as those who are pressing into me are marching through Satan's kingdom. They're rioting and tearing down strongholds. They're tearing down places of authority. They're tearing down where the enemy has felt comfortable. And the destruction of the buildings and so forth, that was just symbolic. You understand what I'm saying? And so what's happening is this. As we are continuing to press into God, like our, our Sunday evening, the prayer time, okay, do you realize that symbolically what this represents is we're joining the rioting believers in the realm of the Spirit doing destruction to the things of the enemy. And that's what's been, what has been going on since late 2019. This is why we can't let up. We're having an impact in Satan's kingdom. Those of us here, the, the folks in Immokalee, the folks in Tulsa, the folks wherever they are, wherever they are in the world who are pressing in like this, the, the repenting and, and all these things that are going on, everything that we're doing to press deeper into God in the Spirit. We're a, a big mass of believers rioting in the spirit where Satan has set up his kingdom, where he has set up his, his strongholds. We're marching through and we're tearing stuff down. We're destroying it. We're, wreck, we're wreaking havoc where he has set up camp and has felt safe. And now the tables are turning. So his response is to bring into the natural what we have been doing in the spirit. We can't give up. And that's why to anybody who's a part of this church and you're just not showing up for the prayer times on Sunday night, I'm asking you rethink this. Because see, the more that you separate, the, the more that you distance yourself from what we're doing, what God is doing here, is the more that you're stepping outside the covert. You're stepping outside the strong tower. You're stepping outside the tabernacle. You understand the imagery. You're stepping outside and away from it. And there comes a point in time, listen, to, there's a come, there comes a point in time to where if you go too far, you're going to be exposing yourself to the enemy. And stuff could happen. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you, this is the way it is in a fallen world. And what we have done here is we have created a place, you call it a haven of rest, but we have created a place here where people can come and be safe and be part of the spiritual riot that is tearing down the things of the enemy. This is one of the reasons why we know we're seeing revival. Because the more we tear down, 
on Satan's main street is, is the less that's hindering people from coming to Jesus. I'm telling you, we're a part of something incredible. And the call is to me. Come deeper. Make a greater effort. Do more. And so the battle is between me and my flesh. Flesh says, I don't want to. Spirit says, but you need to. Flesh says, I don't care. <laughs> and God says, you know, I can kind of help you out here with this, but it's your flesh. You're the one who has to do this. I'm not going to do it for you. I already did my part when I sent my son down there and he allowed his flesh to be destroyed on that cross. I want you all to be encouraged with this, please, to understand more clearly what is happening here in this church and what we are accomplishing in the realm of the Spirit with believers all over the world who are pressing in as are we. Do not, do not hammer yourself with condemnation over, oh, I'm just not doing what, no, you know what? We've reached this point. Now, we continue to go, uh, go forward. We continue to move on, all right? Take this message as encouragement, as revelation, and maybe a um, like motivation to, I'm, I am going to put forth more effort to do this. And for folks listening to this who maybe have been kind of, maybe not as consistent in their attendance, you know, beat the flesh on this one. Seriously, honest, you need to be here. Because of what this place represents and what we're doing, you need to be here. It's not legalism. No, it's not legalism. You know, <laughs> you know what happens in the military, in boot camp? You know, four o'clock in the morning, you know, time to get up. We have to go out, you know, got to do our 20 mile run, got to whatever, you know, all that stuff. All right, now, now, if you're there in, in the barracks and you don't get up, well, you know the drill sergeant's going to give you the what for. And if it continues, you know what's going to happen? Dishonorable discharge. Well, the one thing you don't want in the army of God is a dishonorable discharge. Because <laughs> once, once they remove you from your position in the military, no longer do you have the military benefits that come with it. You're out. And it's not that the military won't fight to defend you. It's just you're no longer going to receive the benefits of being in the military. Same thing here. Guys, you need to be here. Because of what we represent to God and because of the damage that we do to Satan's kingdom. Praise the Lord, we are on the right path. Hallelujah. Please stand. Father, I thank you for this word tonight. And, um, you know, Father, I'm aware that I need to put forth more effort. And I haven't done it the way that I should. I understand that. And I've, I've got to fight harder. And I, I know I can. It's just a matter of doing it. And I think, Father, I speak probably, maybe, everybody here, everybody watching and listening. Father, we truly want to be used to you. And I thank that you do want to use us. I thank you, Father, that you're willing to work with us as we go from spiritual weakness to spiritual strength. And I thank you, Father, for that vision of how we are rioting down Satan's main street and tearing his stuff to pieces. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Well, Father, I thank you for uh, supplying all our need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus, not just as a ministry, but as individuals and as families. And I thank you for watching over us and protecting us. I ask you to prepare our hearts and minds for what you want to do this coming Sunday. Father, may your glory be revealed. May it be real and strong and powerful. And your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. Well, you guys have a blessed remainder of the evening. Thank you uh, watching. Thank you for joining us. Um, any offerings? You guys just, you know what to do. And those of you watching, please 
uh, just be obedient to God or what you would purpose to send in. And, and thank you. I truly appreciate it. God bless you wherever you are in the world. And uh, we'll see you guys this coming weekend.